Hey YouTube, it's Demetri, and today we're gonna to talk about why I ended up in model validation, what is model validation quickly, and how you can kind of find your path and your way in a career. Um, in probably many areas you just don't realize you want to go or you know much about here. So to start off with here, how did I end up in model validation? For those of you that don't know, I spent probably seven years, give or take, um, just doing model validation at a big bank and in a consulting firm. So again, global firms, both of them, large institutions, lots of regulations, ended up on what's called model risk management, which is just the validation side of this. Um, I actually started my career doing model implementation, which most of you would consider quant dev. So we would get models in for CCAR, for example. We built out our first implementation team on the CCAR side. And more or less, when CCAR and DFAS came around, we would have to take all these models that were developed, run them quickly, get results, um, and actually present the results upward to the teams and the businesses and the process there um, to get results quickly. So this was optimizing code, um, simplifying model runs. I had tons and tons of headaches of arguing over how code was written, why it was written the way it was written, and then having to rewrite stuff and just ensuring matches and fits quant dev, uh, implementation, optimization of code, um, processes, math, and all that sort of stuff. That was where I started. Did that for a year. It was awesome. A lot of fun. I enjoyed working with the businesses. Um, I also got to do model development. They were short-staffed on model development. Got my foot in the door within three months. I was already up and running and doing model development and helping different teams in the economics department, um, as well as some of the CCAR modeling itself. So I was doing a lot of the actual model development of time series models for CCAR. Then career-wise, I ended up switching, went into New York City, went to a big consulting firm, um, started on internal audit for a short stint, wrapped up a project for them on that, and they said, hey, we need you to go into model validation. Awesome. I've never done model validation, but you know what? Math and stats is math and stats, and it's all in finance. So I went into that process, went through, and they said, here's a lot of documentation. Here's the models they built. Review all of this. Let us know if it's done well, um, and here's kind of a template you go through. General template for model validation is going to be data. So you have data process, procedures, cleaning, all that sort of stuff where you're looking at how the data was handled, where the data is coming from, that sort of thing. And then you go into what's called conceptual soundness, which is more or less like, why did you pick the model you picked to solve the problem? Often there is, should be discussion in your model development documentation on we tried X amount of approaches, uh, given the variables, the data, the, all these sorts of analysis. Conceptually, this was the model that was the best model and here is why. And then finally, you go into the results section, which talks more about like fit, uh, residual analysis, residual testing, talking about that a little more so on how the output of the model is beneficial and will solve the business problem with that. And then finally, you have what's called OPM, ongoing performance monitoring, governance, those sort of tools at the end of that, which is we have this model, we built it, um, you know, these are the results. And then how are you going to manage, maintain, and use this model going forward? This is typically where you put like the big caveats of this model is not intended to be used for this, 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 and this. It is only designed to be used for this. Um, these are the assumptions behind the model. These are the weaknesses behind the model. Maybe statistical tests you couldn't get, you know, passed. They couldn't quite, you know, meet specific sort of standards. Issues and all those all get discussed towards the end of this in the governance and monitoring section because your model governance and your monitoring should address those weaknesses in a qualitative manner, um, often a little bit quantitative in the sorts of tracking metrics and all that. And then finally, there's some sort of conclusion to that process. That's model validation. That's what we go through. Now, I spent seven years doing this and I never had any sort of inkling. I never heard of it in grad school. I didn't even know I wanted to do it. And I ended up falling into it again at this consulting firm. And then I went on to work at one of the big global banks doing this job full time again for about seven years. And I loved it. Uh, it was an amazing job, an amazing opportunity. And why is because you get to see all these models from all these different development teams. You get to see a bunch of different areas within the business. So it could be credit, it could be operational, market risk, you know, regulatory risk. You get a lot of access across the board here. And then on top of that, you get to actually look and see how people are doing their work. And then you get to go back and say, like, is there a better way to do this? Or, you know, it says, like, they did some sort of test, statistical test here, um, I'll get, bring up my favorite test of all, which is the augmented Dickey Fuller test for stationary testing within time series models. And they will say, we ran this test, we couldn't find any data that met this, this, and this, you know, and these stats came out and it was invalid. So we just went through and did whatever approach. Maybe you did the Cochrane or cut with an OLS estimation or something like that. They did something. And then as a validator, you to look at that and go, I wonder if there's actually, if they did all the approaches, I wonder if I can figure out a way to solve that. And for what they're called tier one models, you have tier one, which is the most important. Tier two is like mediocrely important. And tier three is like marketing models and things that 
aren't critical, but you need them for running the business. Tier one models, you get to spend a lot more time digging and being like, oh, I wonder if I can do this. And often I'd go in and do things and find actual solutions on how they should have been done. Now, again, being able to understand models, it's more like a financial engineer. You have some sort of model that you're engineering. They built it to address some sort of problem. And then as a validation person, you get to see what's built and go in and go, wow, this wasn't done very well. Or these pieces don't look quite right. They're telling me it can't be done. And you get to go through and adjust things and say like, okay, you had like a data cleaning issue and I don't agree with the way they did this. They filled it in using, I don't know, the median, for example. And I'd go through and go, well, why don't we use like a non-parametric method and do some curve fitting and then fill some data points and do a bunch of other work. It's a lot of work, but you look at it and go, okay, you know, given the, I'm going to say more proper, more statistical, more valid approach to doing this, what is the difference on the outcome at the end of the model here? So you get to tinker with it and you go, okay, this was a not great approach to doing it. Here's a better way to do it. And then you go through the model process and you kind of follow on model development and you try to get a model similar to theirs, but with a proper adjustment of somewhere in this modeling. And then you come out and you say, okay, the difference in the results was negligible. So you can write a validation finding and say like, this should have been done differently, um, but it's not a finding. It's really just a recommendation because the results were, you know, slightly different. Or you come and say, well, that one small change in the data actually invalidates the entire conceptual soundness approach that you used. The model you use is not the proper approach because of an issue in the data or the modeling method or some sort of statistical test that led you a different direction. And then you go through this process and you chase down this process and you say, this was the better way to do it and here is why and here are the results and they are material. Material being key here, right? The output is significantly different. Model validation was an, an amazing opportunity, an amazing journey for me because I got to dig in, um, criticize models, put together new methods for how things should have been done better, and to really see the process um, from kind of like a bird's eye view of looking at the firm, the modeling, and the quantitative side of this entire process here. Now, I also was very, very blessed to actually run up career-wise through the ranks, and I was able to see risk management. Risk management is a big, big umbrella. We're gonna call it ERM, Enterprise Risk Management. ERM has a quantitative side and it has a qualitative side. There's what's called model governance and processes and all that. Model governance is like, how do you track deadlines and do project management? That's a part of it. Um, there's policies and procedures and standardizations of how we go about actually managing risk. So let's say somebody writes a policy and says, you know, I don't know. When you know we have credit, this is the credit policy, these sorts of rules are in place, you have to ensure you have consistency across the entire firm, right? You can't be treating customers differently. You can't be treating clients differently. Um, even internal processes and procedures need to be consistent across the board. A lot of enterprise risk management, which is this big umbrella, is how do we look at our risk, our unknown pieces of this? And there's a quantitative modeling piece of this, which is model development, which sits with the business as first line of defense. You have model validation, which is the oversight and criticizes and challenges. So through an effective challenge, independent challenge against the business, the first line, which is model development and the actual business users. And then you will finally have like internal audit, which is typically your complete oversight, which is your third line of defense here. These all end up following under risk management. But there are the quantitative modeling side, there are rules, policies, procedures, um, guardrails, co like common sense things. Like, you know, let's say you're at a trading firm or something like, you know, how do you allot some sort of position to a trader, a book, and then how do you limit those losses? You might have specific rules in place, like you can only take X amount of risk and risk is defined as this metric. And you go through this process of building out process and procedure, right? It's not a model, it's not statistical, um, something simple, some rule, some training, some piece that gets followed here in general. So that has been a lot of that process here. And now going into the career side of this, did I ever imagine going into this validation and risk management? No, I didn't even know this really existed. I had no idea what it was. Um, I know there's a lot of misconceptions because people will say, oh, risk management's not really quantitative. And they look at the governance side of it, or they look at like the analytics tools, like the monitoring and the tracking, which is often the first line. Um, and then you're like, I didn't know that there's a whole quantitative division. And again, it depends where you're at in the industry. Are you on the buy side, the sell side, big firm, small firm? Um, you know, what sorts of regulations and rules apply to these different firms, depending on your line of business and everything. These all impact it. Smaller firms that are less regulated don't have validation. It's just not there. 
Bigger banks, I would argue the biggest, 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 highest regulated banks typically have the best standards and really chase this on an academic level. Um, since probably 20, after, co probably right around post COVID, a lot of validation standards started falling. It's one reason I left. I didn't feel like I was adding value anymore to these firms. So why am I gonna stick around and collect a paycheck and kind of just check off paperwork? Because imagine you throw over a massive document and you just have say, hey, can you read this and you know, make some notes on it and then sign off? That's very, very different than saying like, I think the data or the modeling method should have been different. And then actually going through the process of building out a challenger competing model to say it was done right or wrong. It's, it's statistics and math. It's not so simple as like, yeah, it was done wrong. And then you just make a note. So again, ranges of validation, rigor, quality, all that varies widely. So just because you worked in a validation job does not mean it's going to be as rigorous and interesting as other jobs within validation. Now, part of that process as well with the career part, I would urge you guys to look at exploring different career opportunities because often you will fall into these like I did, right? Started grad school, I started undergrad in finance, wanted to be, you know, some of the brains behind Wall Street and I wanted to be trading and building models and I thought this was all one big package. And then I got into it and I realized I needed to get a quantitative finance degree of some sorts, whether it's applied economics, like econometrics, whether it's applied math with some programming and finance, whether it's financial engineering, quantitative finance masters, like there's a bunch of things you can do. But I ended up getting into that realm and realizing like, wait, I don't even want to end up in trading because I realized trading is very different. The industry has split these jobs out now. So you have trading, quant dev, um, quants, like you have different roles and companies will start to split these things out. Like, so y'all have a, a quant that specializes only in credit, one that's only in risk, but it might only be like market risk. Um, you might start to get these really, really narrow positions here. I would urge you guys go out there and do some informational interviews, talk to a lot of people, figure out what the industry is like. You're not gonna actually understand it until you get into the industry and work in there. And there was a quote recently of somebody who was on the buy side who said, you know, this is what we do. They're giving a lot of advice, which was awesome and helpful. And then they said, but for those of you on the banking and the sell side, I have really no idea what you do. I have friends in there. I don't know. They build models and do some other stuff, but that's not really my area of expertise. That's the critical piece. As you get into a career, you're going to get narrowed down to get pigeonholed um, closer and closer and closer to some sort of specialty, right? We hire experts in a field. You don't want someone who's a generalist across everything. And I know I'm saying this is someone who's fairly a generalist who's bounced around the industry here, but typically you will narrow down into some sort of area. And you might have a bunch of different pigeonholes in that area, um, but I would urge you guys to chase fun and exciting things based on the skill sets that interest you. Um, when I graduated, I realized I just wanted to do modeling and statistics. I didn't know what that was really called. I didn't know what the job titles were called. I rewrote my entire resume, made it really look stats focused and econometrics focused because that's what I enjoyed doing. And I got two job offers in the model development, model validation, uh, and model implementation kind of side of this, but it was more on the development and validation side. That's where my skills sat. That's where my interests sat. The only reason I happened to fall into the proper positions, things that were interesting, was solely because my resume reflected the skills that I wanted to do. Not because I was trying to write a resume to fit some sort of job. I spent months, probably six to eight months doing that, writing the perfect resume, right? In air quotes here. There's no perfect resume. It was too general. It was too boring. Um, but don't be afraid to chase new opportunities, fall into different spaces. I remember in grad school, the last of all the areas I'd ever want to end up in was this really boring area of credit. And I've spent a large portion of my career, the majority of my career in credit. And it's been extremely fascinating and very heavily math and stats driven, which is really what I enjoy doing here. So I would recommend you guys go out there, explore, talk to people, network, um, try to find a lot of material on different jobs, titles, responsibilities, and just hear out from everybody to kind of listen to what's going on. Um, those big fancy jobs that everybody talks about, they can be interesting, they can be fascinating, but there's gonna be a lot of different areas like in fintechs and data firms and you know banks and even investing side. Like I see a lot of people ignore like the wealth management side, um, even companies like, you know, like Fidelity, BlackRock, like they don't realize there's a lot of quant jobs in these places as well. And you should really kind of expand your knowledge here and chase different opportunities because who knows, you might wake up like me 10, 11 years later and realize I built an entire career in an area that I absolutely love being in, risk management, quantitative finance, where everything gets put together is very exciting for me. Um, but I just didn't know it existed. And I even saw it there and thought, oh, that looks boring because I didn't really know what people do in that space here. But anyways, the takeaway from this video is to really chase those skills and you know jobs and tasks that interest you um, from the side of what is intellectually stimulating and fun and exciting to do. Um, don't go chasing a job title or a specific firm. Um, 
you will see you'll be much happier in the long run by finding something that is very aligned with your interests and your hobbies and even like who you are as a person personality wise um, than you will be trying to chase some sort of title because you think it looks good on paper or you've only heard that side of the story. So anyways, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time. Thank you.